including the Vice Chancellor Gold Medal and the Chancellor Gold Medal in his Bachelor's of Laws and Masters of Laws program, respectively. His research interests cover several subject areas in public international law, including human rights and global governance, criminology, criminal justice, constitutional law, and public policies. His papers are also published in many referred journals, and he has presented his research papers in several national and international seminars and conferences as well. Also representing India, we have with us Sir Navdeep Jain, who is also a professional lawyer, and his practice covers regularly representing clients before the Honorable Apex Court, the Delhi High Court, the District Court of Delhi, Noida, Gazabad, the NCLT, the NCLAT, and other legal forums in Delhi. He's also currently a senior associate, senior associate and advocate at Record Nikolesh Ramachadran. He also has gained exposure to working with public sector, undertaking like the NHA, I, and also the Airport Authority of India. He's extremely experienced at drafting and filing SLPs, appeals, writ petitions, both civil as well as criminal, not only before the Supreme Court, but also before the High Court of Delhi. He completed his law education at Amity Law School, Noida, in 2015. We are really honored to have you with us. And representing UK as well, we have Sam Malik, who I believe would join us shortly as well. He's a British qualified solicitor and higher court advocate who specializes in criminal law with over 30 years of experience within the British legal system. And outside of the legal profession, he has served as a non-executive director on the Primary Care Trust, the NHS, and he has also served as the governor of his local college and served on various community forums and also lectured in law. He's also passionate about theater and has performed on stage in England and also here in Dubai. Now, to take us further in the discourse for today, welcome to every one of our speakers and to take us further on the discourse we have today, I would like for us, our speakers, can you please turn on your camera, please, for our participants to see you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay, yes, I'll be starting with Sir Muhammad, who is representing the Bangladesh. Sir, we would like you to enlighten us on what is actually obtainable in your country and death penalty to form as a foundation before we delve into other questions as well. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, thank you, Shumaya, for giving me the floor, and uh, thank you, International Legal League, for inviting me to uh, speak on death penalty. Um, so since I'll be just focusing on the perspective of Bangladesh, I will first give an interaction about uh, the crimes for which death penalty is being given in Bangladesh. Um, and then I'll talk about with how, how much it is obtainable or how uh, this punishment deters uh, the other of uh, people to not to commit this kind of crime. Uh, so if I uh, start with the introduction of Bangladesh, uh, first of all, I'd say that I'd like to clarify that uh, even though a considerable number of countries have already abolished death penalty, uh, Bangladesh is yet to abolish death penalty. In other words, it's, uh, death penalty is permitted in Bangladesh. So to be very specific, uh, according to the criminal justice system of Bangladesh, there are a total uh, 60 uh, death eligible offenses in different laws in our country. Um, and out of this 60 death eligible offenses, there are uh, 42 offenses for the ordinary people and then 18 for the military personnel. So like if I uh, specify what are the, what are the laws uh, that have uh, permitted death penalty to be provided to the offenders, then first of all, I would uh, talk about Penal Code 1860. Penal Code is a law which is applicable for the general people of Bangladesh. I mean, if a person is found to have committed uh, the crimes which are being considered as crimes under Penal Code, then that person is being given death penalty. Not for all the crimes, there are some specific crimes. Uh, I'll not talk about all the crimes because there are in total 10 crimes for which death penalty has been given under uh, the Penal Code 1860. 
But if I talk about uh, some major crimes, for example, uh, waging war, uh, it means if a person wages or attempts to wage or encourage uh, war against Bangladesh, maybe uh, provide a death penalty if he's found guilty. Um, a second one, I mean, second major uh, crime is abating mutiny. Uh, uh, like mutiny has happened in Bangladesh before 2010. So mutiny has become a great concern for the people of Bangladesh. So like uh, if a person is found to have abated mutiny, then that person can be provided death penalty. Uh, the third one is, I would say, murder. If a person is found to have committed aggravated murder, premeditated murder, that that person is, uh, can be provided to death penalty. And then uh, if a person attempts to commit murder, uh, or if a person uh, who has been already uh, convicted for committing uh, a, cr a crime and the person has been provided life imprisonment and after uh, you know, enjoying the crime of life imprisonment or during uh, the, uh, you know, enjoying the punishment of uh, life imprisonment, if that person commits uh, a crime which is punishable with death penalty, then that person also can be provided to death penalty. So these are the major crimes which uh, are concerned uh, according to Penal Code 1860. I mean, these are the main crimes. There are some other crimes as well, but these are the main crimes for which a person can be provided to uh, death penalty as per the Penal Code 1860. Uh, another one is the Constitution of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. I mean, we have a constitution and according to Article 7A of the constitution, if a person, uh, like if any person by any unconstitutional means abrogates, suspends, or ripple our constitution or attempts to do all these things, then that person is punished with the highest punishment. So in Bangladesh, the highest punishment is death penalty. So therefore, if a person is found to have committed, uh, like abrogated or suspended or tried to repeal the constitution of Bangladesh, which is the Supreme Law, then that person can be provided to death penalty as per the constitution of the People's Republic. Uh, now, the third law that I'll be focusing on is uh, International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973. Uh, this is a law uh, which is uh, very much important or very much connected to the history of Bangladesh. Uh, as you might be aware of the fact that Bangladesh became independent after a liberation war in 1971. There was a war between Bangladesh and Pakistan. Bangladesh was a part of Pakistan before 1971. Bangladesh was known as East Pakistan and Pakistan which is currently known as Pakistan, was uh, known as West Pakistan. So during 1971's war, uh, there were many people, Bangladeshi people, who uh, helped the Pakistani armies to commit different crimes. For example, uh, the most serious international crimes, for example, um, uh, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. So the persons who have been found to have committed these sort of crimes they were given death penalty under the International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973. And after uh, 2010, the trial started in 2010, uh, after almost 40 years of our liberation war. So after, when the uh, trial started, there, were de there was a demand among the people that the person who have committed crime against humanity, genocide and war crimes in 1971 against the people of Bangladesh, they should be hanged to death. So this is a major uh, issue which is being dealt under the International Crimes Tribunal Act 1972. Uh, another uh, law which is uh, which is very crucial, I would say, because this is a, a special law, especially for the women and the child. Uh, the law is known as Women and Child Repression Prevention Act 2000. Uh, this law is enacted especially for child and women because these are the two kinds of people who are considered as vulnerable people from the context of Bangladesh. So if a uh, woman is found, uh, killed after a rape, then the person who has uh, killed the uh, woman after raping her uh, should be, or he or she is, or he is given a uh, death penalty. Uh, and then if uh, you know, a group of person is found to have committed gang rape, then they are also given death penalty. Uh, moreover, dowry is a very uh, you know, uh, 
big problem in Bangladesh because a uh, lot of women are being demanded to give uh, money from their, uh, you know, uh, from their father's uh, house or from their brother or their uh, family to, uh, I mean, they, they're, they're imposed some punishment or, uh, you know, domestic, they, uh, they face some domestic balances uh, so that they, you know, like influence their family members to provide money to their husbands. So dowry, since dowry is a very big problem, so if a person is found to have caused death for uh, non, uh, you know, uh, for not being dead, then that person is also punished with death penalty. These are the major laws along with, uh, we have Anti-Terrorism Act 2009. Uh, this law also introduced uh, death penalty as a punishment. There are some other laws I'm not going to explain uh, all these uh, crimes. I mean, if I just state the names of the laws, for example, the Arms Act 1878, uh, the Special Power Act 1974, uh, Acid Offenses Prevention Act 2002, Human Trafficking Prevention and Suppression Act 2012, Army Act 1952, Air Force Act 1953, Navy Ordinance 1961, and some other laws for the Coast Guard or Border Guard people. So, these are the laws uh, which have permitted providing death penalty to the criminals in Bangladesh. So I've just uh, talked about, I mean, just given a foundation about what are the laws that have permitted death penalty in Bangladesh and what are the crimes, major crimes for which a person is being provided with death penalty. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, um, while um, Sam Hamad was taking us through that exposing, um, Samali came in as well. And just to leave a um, background of introduction into him as well, I would like to then um, call out the um, bio again. Um, Samali is a British qualified solicitor and IR court advocate who specializes in criminal law with over 30 years of experience within the British legal system. And outside of the legal profession, he served as a non-executive director on the primary care trust, also the NHS, and he has served as a governor of his local college and served on various community forums and also lectured in law. Sir, so you're welcome and we're honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Firstly, my sincere apologies to everybody. I just don't know what went wrong. My apologies for keeping my friends waiting uh, and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, now we're moving down to Nigeria. Ma, we want you to also now explain to us um, what is obtainable as it is on the penalty in Nigeria. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's good morning. So it's good afternoon here. Thank you for the bio. I First of all, I want to start by saying thank you to the International League Legal League for inviting us. And I also want to extend the regrets of the SAN, the senior advocate, for his unavailability un un to attend the session. He had um, an audience meeting he had to take, and then he was out of the state, so he couldn't make it. So he asked me to express his impressed, sincerest regrets to you and apologies. And so, um, with respect to Nigeria, death penalty is very much a part of our laws. Um, you can see that even though as much as the world is moving in a different direction, Nigeria's laws are very codified and there has been no amendment to abolishing death penalty. But um, the constitution of Nigeria actually provides or guarantees the right to life. So as I believe most laws do, most countries do. So there's a guarantee for the, life, the right to life. However, that same provision says that upon conviction or a particular crime, that right, that right can be can be infringed upon, and it's upon that basis that we have certain offences in Nigeria that other laws provide for the death penalty as a punishment upon conviction. And so these laws are so Nigeria basically, in terms of our laws, especially with regards to criminal criminal offences, are, are are looked at within regions. So we have the Criminal Code Act. The Criminal Code Act is basically regulates the southern part of Nigeria. And then we say southern because it's, um, it's within the south and the north, because that is where the differences occur. So within the south, and then the south is, 
largely as it applies to other Eastern and Western sta um, states in Nigeria as well. So that's a generic form when I say the South, but the North is strictly to the North, the North Central, the North East and all of that. So within the South, we have the Criminal Code Act. The Criminal Code Act states that certain offenses are the, con the convictions, upon conviction, the death penalty is applicable. So those offenses are, in the Criminal Code Act, we have culpable homicide. So where you have murder, the, in Nigeria, we have culpable homicide. And then, the, in fact, when you charge those cases in court, you, you, you state culpable homicide punishable by death according to the section. So the punishment for murder is death. And in also with respect to treason, treasonous crimes, treasonous felonies, and all matters related thereto, the con upon conviction, the sentencing is by death. We also we have um, terrorism, so that that we like to think it's a big because we need. Uh, okay, so we didn't. Terrorism wasn't a like the Criminal Code Act is um has been is an old law. Terrorism is relatively new, 2015, 2016 but it also provides for the death penalty as well. And so where you are convicted of terrorism, there's a death penalty attached to it. The, some of the concerns we have with respect to terrorism and the, because terrorism is what we say it is. And then terrorism acts are oftentimes are, well, they have their own, they have, they have their, there are certain ingredients that, because we know that some groups that, uh, some groups are labeled as terrorist groups then we now wonder, are they terrorist groups because of the political um, connotations that they may have and all of that. So, but in essence, if you're found guilty of terrorism in Nigeria, the death penalty mm -hmm. is the uh, appropriate sentence. Then we also have, um, well, that's for the South. But when you come to the North, there are certain other things like homosexuality has a death penalty in the North. Um, we have rape as a death penalty in the North. We have, um, um, culpable homicide also. So because and in the North, we have the Penal Code Act. And so that's the distinguishing um, um, factor. So in the South, we have the Code Act. And under the Penal Code Act, blasphemy is punishable by death. Um, rape is punishable by death. Homosexuality is punishable by death. Um, apostasy is punishable by death. So all of these, so in, 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 in the laws is basically on which country, which state you're in, and you, then the applicable law will apply. But for, with regards to the, um, so that's with regards to the offenses that are punishable by death. But with regards to the laws that allow, we also have certain special um, laws like the Armed Forces Act. The Armed Forces Act says that if anybody's convicted of treason or related offenses to treason, the, death, the punishment is by death. We also have the armed, the armed robberies and firearms act. If you're convicted of armed robbery in Nigeria, your the, the death sentence, the, the appropriate sentence is by death. And so these are the acts and these are the offenses. They are very much um it's very it's a it's a very um it's a very it's, I, I like to say that Nigeria I, it's a very present Thing. So, uh, in fact, when you, when you handle cases in court and these are the offenses, it's not even a question of should they or should they not. The laws are codified. In fact, upon charging, you state the offense and you state the punishment that is applicable to that. So, it's very much a part of our laws and it is seen in different states and um, different regions. And then I say, I don't mention the states so much because we have 36 states and the FCT. Because the Criminal Code Act and the Penal Code Act, they are the foundations, they are the fundamental laws. Because when you go to states, you will see that they are but a replica of what these laws hold. So that's why the most important legislation to look at will be the Criminal Code Act and the Penal Code Act. If you go to a state where it is either in the South or in the North, you will find um, provisions of in their criminal laws that are a replica, replica of what those acts already provide for. So these are the these are what this is what is obtainable in Nigeria. It's a very present, um, it's a very present um, um, concept here, and then we practice it. If now, if we talk about if they are actually, if these sentences are actually carried out, that's now a whole different conversation entirely. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, ma'am. And um, now we move on to Star Navdeep. Thank you very much. Well, I yes, want to express my yes, gratitude to uh, International Legal uh, for inviting me and providing me a platform to express my views over the death penalty as an effective measure in the 21st century. So I would like to begin with the fundamental thing, which is like, uh, what is the criteria of punishment? First of all, we should examine the issue that what punishment is. So why somebody is being... Uh, you know, punished with something. There are three objectives behind it. First is retribution. Second is reformation. And third is deterrence. So retribution is something, you have done something wrong. And for that wrong thing, you are being punished. And reformation is something, you know, a chance is being given to the person so that he can reform himself. And deterrence is what? Deterrence is providing basically a punishment basically to create a fear in the mind of the person who has such who has done an act which is wrongful which is not acceptable to the society so these are the basic three objectives of the punishment now after considering the ob uh, objectives of the punishment uh, let's discuss the issue of death penalty first of all so death penalty is something which is in india which is which is being offered in the rarest of rare cases now the definition i i would i would like to give give you a uh, introduction from the very basic uh, day from the day the constitution of india was drafted and from 1950 onwards so when the situation was when the constitution of india was drafted for the first time so in those initial 5 years uh, the death penalty was a normal punishment for uh, in that scenario why because the constitution was evolving, it was emerging, it was developing, it was accepting uh, scopes of other law, other countries' laws also. So, if in the initial five years, death penalty was a normal punishment. Thereafter, in 1955, uh, this was changed to the discretion of the trial court judge who is examining the issue, whether he need to award that sentence to the accused person or he can also award life imprisonment to the accused person. Thereafter, in 1973, the Criminal Procedure Code of, of our country amended. And in that, the parliament specifically made a mention that whenever in any case, death penalty or life imprisonment is being awarded, a reason has to be recorded that why death penalty is awarded to him, why death sentence is awarded to him, or why life imprisonment is awarded to him. Thereafter, in 1979, the famous case, Bachchan Singh, with the name of Bachchan Singh, uh, the Apex Court held that death penalty could only be imposed in rarest of the rare cases where there is no alternative punishment is available for that heinous crime. This law was later, later evolved in Machi Singh versus State of Punjab, wherein they have stipulated two tests which are to be observed while applying if whether when 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 a, when a judge is trying to apply the punishment of death penalty so those those two tests should comply of number one something which is uncommon about the crime and secondly the circumstances in which the crime has been committed and there is no inadequate other there is no adequate other punishment available in the codified laws so these two tests will have to be applied and subject to the outcome of these two tests, then this decision will be decided that whether death penalty should be awarded to the accused person or not. So this was an, uh, basically an overview how the law of death penalty evolved in the country India. Now I would uh, like to uh, tell you the, uh, I would like to convey the protections which are, which are guaranteed under the constitution of India. So first of all, article 21 of the constitution of India, it stipulates right to life which means that no person shall be deprived of life and personal liberty. So this is a protection against the death penalty. Then next, if we move on to Article 72, which empowers the president to uphold any uh, death penalty imposed on any accused person. And the third thing which comes is judicial review. Always, if even if a, a sentence, a death sentence judgment passed by the Honorable Supreme Court, a review may again be filed. So before the Supreme Court only. 
so this was the third aspect now the fourth protection which is available is article 134 of the constitution of india that is right to appeal whenever any judgment whenever in in any judgment a accused person is being acquitted by the trial court but that penalty has been imposed by the high court considering the evidence and material on on record and if if high court is awarded that penalty then the pers- the accused person can straight away approach to the honorable supreme court for that matter of so these are the pro- these are the four protections which are gar- guaranteed under the uh, under the constitution of under the constitution of india now there are some exceptions to it that in uh like for example murder is committed in a ex- uh, murder is committed in extremely like for murder there is a punishment available like that penalty may be awarded but in that situation also it has to be observed that the murder is committed in extremely brutal manner so as to so as to uh, cover that brutality which has been done by the accused person death sentence is being awarded to him or for uh, murder is committed with a motive which 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 evidences torture depreciity and uh, meanness so in that that event also death penalty will be awarded or crimes in enormous in proportion crimes which are which which are pretty enormous in those situations uh, death penalty will be imposed so oh, so for uh, a famous colombian professor mr jeffrey fagan along with this Uh, uh along with this two researcher have have uh, shown that there are several countries in the research paper they have said so that there are several countries there are more than 100 countries who have already abolished death penalty uh, and uh, abolishing of uh, abolishing of death penalty or awarding of death penalty uh, does not decrease the rate of crime that was something which has been observed by him in his paper so uh, what he did was he did a comparative study of hong kong as well as of singapore in hong kong the death penalty has been abolished in the year 1993 itself whereas in singapore it is still being practiced so obviously the geographical situation the crime rate both the things are different in both the places but when 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 the comparison was done so even though the death penalty is being continued in singapore though the crime rate is uh, almost similar in both hong kong as well as singapore so death penalty is not something which will you know uh, reduce the crime rate but it will not give a good picture to the society which may be fearful to the society so this this was one of the aspect observed by uh, colombian professor mr jeffrey fagan uh, there is another uh, professor mr daniel nagin uh, he is a famous criminologist also who said that if you want to reduce the crime then rather than strictly punishing the accused person you should rather Im- improve the system in accepting the in arresting the criminals so that is again something which is meaningful which i find that uh, if you want to you know decrease the crime rate or you want to uh, create a fear in the mind of people see how how the accused person will have a fear if we look uh, if we look from the point of view of a criminal criminal will have two things in his mind uh before doing any wrongful act number first extent of punishment and secondly will be the likelihood of getting caught so the former one extent of punishment if if for a moment kept aside the likelihood of getting caught will be the first thing will come in the mind of the uh, uh, accused person or whoever is intending to do any uh, wrongful act so we should rather focus more on uh, on arresting the criminals rather than you know uh, punishing them with death penalty and uh, otherwise also uh, if we find out the purpose of death penalty what is the purpose of ben- uh, death penalty that is to give the society a impression that see you might be uh, you might be uh, you might have to face this if you do it therefore uh, there there will be a fear in the mind of the people and they will restrain themselves from uh, doing such acts uh, in which death penalty is uh, can be awarded in india so i would like to give a overview of the uh, of the offenses in which uh, death penalty is awarded in india first of all it's murder 
these are basic outlines but they are not very restrictive that in all cases of murder that pen, that penalty will be awarded as i have already said that it, they apply the principle of rarest of rare case this the incident should be of such an event that which 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 horrifies the society which is not acceptable at all or which is extremely brutal in nature so coming back to it uh, if you have done murder if you have done rape if you are involved into terrorism activities or, or if you are uh, or if you have caused uh, if you have created any uh, war state amongst the states other states or uh, in, or you have done such injuries to any person which may result to death or you have raped the woman and you know you have uh, you you have brought it brought her to a situation that she is almost about to die or such situations are like that so if we test uh, so these are the basic uh, <laughs> you one might be punished for uh, punished with that penalty now if we test the constitutional validity of death penalty in india so the death penalty is being backed by the constitutional provisions it has been uh, widely accepted in the constitution of india that happened even way back in 73 as well as in 79 which uh, it, it, at that time it was held okay. that article 21 of constitution of india right to life does not is not does not get violated um, uh, if somebody is um, I'm going penalty. for sure I'm going for sorry hello please could you mute your mic sorry sir you could come. can i continue yes you can continue sir sorry about that so article 21 of constitution of india which is right to life which does not get violated even if a uh, death penalty is awarded to a person because death penalty will be awarded to a person keeping in mind keeping keeping in mind of what that what offense he has committed and the graveness of that offense will be observed so death penalty is not a very common thing which is being awarded in india it is it is again i'm reiterating it that uh it is in the rarest of rare nature now i'll just cite a small example in 2017 a child was murdered after uh, after a sexual assault and the school bus conductor uh was being accused for the murder of the child the bar councils refused to accept the case of the bus conductor uh you know keeping the media trials in mind and other things and believing and making an observation of the bus conductor that he is of such nature that nobody wanted to accept his case so then the courts referred the matter to cbi when the cbi investigated the matter the they they came to a observation they came to a conclusion that he was not at all guilty of that crime that crime was committed by a 16 year old student who was in the same bus so the motive of applying this uh, principle of rarest of rare so that no innocent should be should face such uh, such punishment because if, if the the fundamental objective of the constitution of india will get defeated if any innocent person will be you know will be awarded with such a uh, such a sentence so these are some basic things of my country there's one more thing i would like to uh, one more thing one last thing uh, the in the uh, famous 2611 attacks in the famous uh, 2611 attacks uh, it was not the proud moment for the country that ajmal kasab who was the prime accused in prime accused and a terrorist in that case uh, was given capital punishment but rather it was a proud moment for my country for the legal fraternity of this country that the arrest was offered legal uh, all the legal avail available legal remedies to them and uh, was subjected to a fair trial and thereafter the courts have given their decision that yes he is you know he there is no other uh, punishment available for him Uh, the only punishment available for him is death penalty and so the death penalty he was awarded now once a death penalty uh, death sentence is awarded then the person is kept in custody for the next 14 days in which all his wishes are you know asked about 
he is allowed to meet his uh, family members he is allowed, about to he, he can he is permitted to uh, you know do the spiritual offerings whatever he want to do and so basically the time the, the time period of 14 days is being granted to the uh, is being granted to the accused so that he can end all his worldly affairs and put peacefully hand over himself to the god so these are some basic things i think i missed some questions uh, which were put to me so i would um, would get back to those questions at the end of the session as well right i'll, I'll get back to those questions at the end of the session Thank you very much, sir, for that, for shedding more light on what's obtaining good there in India as well. Moving on now to Sam Malik. Um, as it is in the UK, there isn't death penalty presently, and I believe um, their principles relied upon in the UK for its abolishment. Could you please share more light on what's obtainable in the UK before now and as it is presently, and how it has best shaped the punishment system in the UK? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shobe. Uh, firstly, thank you to International League, a Legal League, for uh, inviting me to this forum to uh, discuss the death penalty. Uh, yes, you're quite right. I am the odd one out uh, from my learned friends from India, uh, Bangladesh, and, and uh, Nigeria, who all have the death penalty. And we all have one thing in common because they still rely on the common law jurisdiction to an extent which was left by the British uh, and yet in Britain as you've quite rightly pointed out we abolished it. Um, Britain has got a very long history of the death penalty and we can look back and we can go as far back as 450 BC uh, when all kinds of executions took place people were thrown into the quagmire we've had uh, hung drawn and executed where a prisoner would be dragged to the execution place, he would then be hung, uh, then they would chop his body into pieces, etc., and hang it on stakes uh, throughout the city, etc. So all kinds of macabre types of executions that took place. But by the 10th century, and I'm sorry, this is going to be a little bit of a history lesson because we don't have a death penalty anymore. So I'll go into the background. By the 10th century, England uh, preferred the preferred method of hanging, uh, the preferred method of execution was hanging. Um, by around about the reign of King Henry the seventh, which was in the 1400s from 1409 to 1447, it's estimated approximately uh, 70,000, 72,000 people were sent to the gallows or, or set, sent to uh, be hung. By the 18th century on the statutes of the English law, there were 200 crimes for which a person could possibly be uh, hung for arranging from simple theft of 40 shillings from a burglary at a house uh, the old coinage was known as shillings it's now pounds obviously from somebody who stole five shillings even for somebody stealing a sheep or uh, cutting somebody's tree down uh, macabre but that's the way it was i think the starting point is probably if nobody has discussed i came in late is to look at the definition of a death penalty what is the definition of a death penalty? Well, capital punishment, also known as the death penalty, is the execution of an offender sentenced to death after conviction by a court of law in a criminal offence. So this does not include extrajudicial killings and so forth. That's a different topic altogether. This is by the state who has the power and can sanction a death penalty upon somebody who's been convicted of a very serious criminal offence and that will be carried out. As my friend, learned friend from India quite rightly pointed out, Amnesty International going back to 19, 2018, there may be further studies in the recent years, I don't know, but certainly by 2018 Amnesty International said that there are 106 countries now who have abolished the death penalty go back to 1977 there were only 16 nations that were ab that had abolished the death penalty so now it's almost half the world has abolished the death penalty and th those statistics are quite interesting i turn to the united kingdom uh, i'll quote um, a quote which was executions are so much a part of the british history that it is almost impossible for many excellent people to think of a future without them. 
this was by Viscount Templewood, uh, who wrote in the temple, uh, sorry, in the shadow of the gallows in 1951. Well, how wrong it could have been because fast forward 13 years to 1964, that is when the last two executions in England took place um, of a Peter Allen and a, a Gwyn Evans for a murder. They were the last two people in England to be hung. They weren't told that they were the last two to be hung, um, unfortunately, but uh, they were the last two. A year later in 1965, by a private member's bill by an MP uh, by the name of Sidney Silverman presented a private bill in Parliament to abolish the death penalty. It's interesting that this abolishment bill came about in Parliament rather than through a vote by the public of what they may have said. In any event, that vote in the Commons was passed by a majority of 200 votes to 98. Subsequently, the bill would then was presented at the House of Lords and again it was passed by a majority of 204 votes to 104 votes and the act that was imposed was the Murder Abolition of Death Penalty Act 1965, which effectively suspended the death penalty for murder over that period for a period of five years. However, Britain still kept the death penalty for, murder, for, for treason and for piracy. That was still there, but nobody during that period was hung uh, from 1965. In 1969, the then Secretary, uh, Home Secretary, uh, James Callaghan, on the 16th of December 1969, presented a motion that the abolishment should be permanent. And in 1969, the death penalty was permanently removed, apart from treason and piracy. That continued. And it was only until recently when, in 1998, the Human Rights Act was passed and the um, Crime and Disorder Act that eventually they abolished the death penalty for treason and piracy. And England became a com completely an abolitionist. So we are now abolitionists. Uh, and we obviously have signed up to the Protocol 6 of the Human Rights Act 1998 now that we cannot revert back to that. But it's interesting to note that from 1965, every subsequent parliament that came in, in the House of Commons, every subsequent parliament had a debate on whether the death penalty should be brought back and it was always defeated. It was never restored. In 2015, and there was a, a, a BBC uh, poll that was done uh, and uh, basically of 2,878 people were polled and 48% of the people um, were in favour of capital punishment. That was quite stark because in 1983, 75% of the public in England were for the death penalty. And now almost 50% were in favour, so a climb down. In 2009, a TV poll took place where uh, a survey was done and 70% of the people said that they would like the death penalty be reintroduced. And the type of crimes that they wanted the death penalty to be reintroduced for was for serious offences of armed robbery, for murder, for rape, for sexual offences against children, etc., uh, for terrorist acts, etc., for paedophilia, any sexual offences, obviously kidnapping and abuse of, of children. Now, based on those, and it's a brief history I've given you, because obviously with the time allocated that we have, I can't obviously go into much more greater detail. It wouldn't do justice to the topic. I would say that as far as England is concerned, we've moved ahead already in the 21st century. We decided that England in principle is against the death penalty. And I think by saying that 106 countries in the world have abolished the death penalty, we have moved into the future. I read an interesting article um, recently by a second year student in Kathmandu uh, by the name of Neetaj Ray. I don't know when this article was written and my friend from India, learned from India, obviously, uh, dis obviously um, discussed 
the type of types of theories of um, punishment because any punishment punishment obviously is an integral part of any criminal society uh, sorry any criminal justice system for any society because the society has to be kept law and order has to be maintained life has to be saved crime has to be reduced people have to have confidence in 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 in, in the criminal procedure obviously the, the, there's four types of punishments and i'll briefly mention them retributive theory the theory of deterrent theory preventive theory, and reformative theory now we in england concentrate more on the reformative therapy we do uh, reformative theory we do not we look at the offense obviously but we look at the offender as well a judge will look at the offender is he a first time offender what's his background what were the circumstances of the offense that he committed etc and then they will look at other things if there is any mental illness there there are any other factors and the judge will then sentence according on proportionality and looking at the guidelines sentencing guidelines of the offense and then so we've moved and had a shift towards the offender as well a more humane uh, uh, reaction this article it was interesting i take verbatim what this what was written by this student uh niti i think i've got the name right bear with me Nitij Rai from India. Uh, he says, prisonization shouldn't be for the purpose of isolating and eliminating them to society, but to bring about a change in their mental outlook through effective measures during the term of their sentence. It's believed that a sympathetic, tactful and loving treatment offenders, I don't know whether we say we should have a loving treatment towards offenders, but I think I understand what he's saying, can have a revolutionary change in their characters. It is strictly against capital punishment because hanging a criminal is merely an admission of the fact that the human beings have failed to reform the erring citizen. I think in the 21st century, it would be right to say that we are a much more humane society. There are much more legal avenues available to us and other avenues available to us where every society, uh, policy makers, et cetera, can look at what is the alternative to the death penalty. And in England, we have harsher penalties now, life imprisonment, where a judge may recommend a minimum sentence of saying for murder, well, you will be in prison for the next 35 years at least before you're even eligible for, for parole. It's more or less a life sentence. Bearing in mind, obviously the victims of a murdered person will want retribution that's understandable it's human nature but i always say think about it this way a perpetrator of a killing a murder will be in prison day and night he will have to suffer because in prison you do not have a health care system you don't have a five course meal there you're going to rot in jail and you're going to be there for life you're going to miss out on seeing your siblings and your colleagues, you know, your colleagues, your friends and so forth. You're going to miss out on birthdays and any other functions and so forth. You are literally going to rot in prison. And that is something because he's going to have every single day to think about what he did. So that's as much as I can say about England, because we don't have a death penalty. Obviously, other, other capacities do. Thank you very much, sir. That was really enlightening. Thank you. Um, now to move on to the effectiveness of the death penalty itself. Now we'll be looking into considering, uh, considering different Sorry, I can't hear you. Around, okay. Sorry, I can't hear you for some reason. Hey, can you hear me now, sir? I can hear you now, sir. Thank you. I can hear you now. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yes, I said now we'll be moving on to questions on the effectiveness of death penalty itself because there have been different submissions on heat being extinguished and yet it's been um, retained in some part of the country and across the globe as well. So now um, this question goes to you, Mrs. Oye. Um, what would you say now, presently, as we have it in the 21st century, on the debate of having, having it extinguished or retained as an effective con punishment? Would you say death penalty has actually been a punishment that has been able to deter criminals in Nigeria? Okay. That's a very um, interesting question. But you know, I think that from all that I've heard, to uh, follow back on what Mr. Mali said, some of the things that has happened to Nigeria is that 
some of the, most of the things that we have done has been an importation of other laws. We haven't had the cost to sit back and really consider if these things are beneficial to us. So that's why the death penalty is still retained in the form and fashion it is now. I don't even think there is any, if there's an argument for it, I don't think it's reflected in any in our legal work because the laws are the laws until they change. They are the laws that will hold effective in Nigeria. I, I, want, I hardly think that there's any lawyer. In my opinion though, this is an, this is an opinion that I have. I don't think there's any lawyer who's line of work in terms of when you have to go to court and you're probably prosecuting the matter. For, in fact, the, the general nature of these proceedings in Nigeria is quite, um, quite humbling. You know, it's, if you are if you are in a scenario where this is being done, this is being handed out as a sentence, the the entire the entire courtroom itself is has a somber, a very somber atmosphere, and as we have a more we are, we are more pomp and pageantry about it because when you know death sentence is coming, the judge robes in a different attire. So even if your client is um, not give, is even if your client was is waiting for sentencing, just the attire of what the judge is wearing, you almost like can infer that this sentence is going to be handed out. And so the entire atmosphere is somber. But in all of this, Nigeria is still in is still is still in chaos. And I feel that it's so much more not that we're not having the conversation, is that our criminal justice system as a whole, it needs to be completely overhauled because it's not working. And sometimes one of the conversations we're having now, for someone like me in Nigeria, it's a bit removed because these are the conversations we're having is how do we ensure that there's proper investigation of crimes? Because if, if we want to hand out a death penalty, we must be sure that the person who's committed the crime is actually the person who committed that crime. So we can't even verify, we, we, are, not even, we are not at a place where we can be sure about the investigation procedures. We're not even sure about um, how the entire proceedings is handled because you can be on a matter, a criminal matter for years. In fact, before we get to the point of death penalty, the, the, some, of, some a lot of accused persons now are behind bars for awaiting trials that they have not, they will not see in the next one year. And even if they're in court, that matter can spend over 10 to 15 years trying to get to this sentencing. So we, we have, the death penalty is so ineffective before we haven't even sometimes in some cases we don't even get to that conversation yet because we're just trying to get through the investigation we're trying to get through the proceedings before we get down to sentencing to even begin to see if it is you know useful or not but some one thing i can say that is encouraging is that we haven't had an actual um this sentencing hasn't actually been carried out in a very long time in Nigeria. So the effectiveness now, I think our entire criminal justice system has not allowed us to fully appreci appreciate that, whether it is effective or not. But just in the entire, I, for me, in the entire proceedings, I, I feel that there's something fundamentally wrong with the death penalty. Even, in the, even as a lawyer who practices in the courts, if you feel you, the, the taking of a life is, 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 is not normal. Even the, some judges even break down in tears when they hand out the sentencing and some prosecution, some counsels yeah. even cry in court. Some are you know, beside themselves emotionally because of the implications of what those things are. But we haven't been able to fully appreciate this effectiveness or, or ineffectiveness because we haven't really gotten to that point where we can sit back and say we handed out 100 sentencings and then this has happened and the crime rate is reduced and all of that. But in, because of the, the nature of our, our justice system, crime is crime is, is, not relate, is not relative to our economic situation. It's relative now to geographic locations in Nigeria. It's not relative now to uh, the general standard of living, you know? So it's not effective in that we haven't really done it. And I think it will still not be effective even if we do it because there's certain fundamental things that we need to sort out within Nigeria before we can have those conversations. But I think this is good because I maybe we might not have a perfect system, but I think that um, 
it makes us appreciate that when we get there, we can have all of this settled. But I want to say this if I'm actually making anything any point at all, is that Nigeria is not in a position to really um speak on data in terms of how we affect because we haven't really done it. And then the system is just too is is too is is broken that we can't fully appreciate it. But because we have our there's no reform because I know there is no reform. Um, the economic situation is very poor. There are no deterrents because even if you're deterrent, you're hungry. So the crime rates just keep going up because the standard of living is very poor and all of that. But I like to think that we are progressive in the sense that we haven't actually um, carried out any sentencing, any death sentencing in actual, in we haven't executed anyone um, in, in their numbers. So I think um, that's very encouraging to us. So that means we are doing the right thing, but <laughs> maybe we've not legally provided for those areas yet. Yes. Thank you for such an enriching answer. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, now, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much for such an enriching answer. Now, oh, to Sir Muhammad. Um, still speaking on the effectiveness of death penalty in Bangladesh. Um, I would like to know what would you say about the submission in the context of what is prevalent to your country with death penalties still in place? Um, it's a saying that the majority of death penalty states shows moderates higher than non death penalty states. What would you say for Bangladesh in this regard? All right. Uh, first of all, like in my opinion, I believe that uh, the punishment of death penalty is a very harsh punishment for uh, the accused person. So it is actually my opinion. However, uh, like a social context of a country varies from country to country. We do share a, lo a lot of similarities in terms of uh, the practices, the customs uh, with India. We have a lot of similarities. I mean, uh, Mr. Nav Navdeep uh, was talking about some cases that we used to refer to in our context as well. Uh, so. Even though from the social context of Bangladesh and India, death penalties are being permitted, but uh, for some people, even for me, it's uh, it's an inhuman punishment and it's, it's really a harsh punishment. Now, if I uh, talk about the effectiveness in Bangladesh, I believe uh, another thing is that instead of providing death penalty, it's more important to uh, increase the rate of conviction of crimes, because in order to reduce uh, the number of crimes, it's uh, really uh, important to increase the rate of conviction because if laws are not being implemented properly, then crimes will increase, whatever the punishment is. So in order to deter the people uh, not to commit any crime, it's important to increase uh, the conviction rate, as I said, again and again. And uh, a law and order situation, uh, I mean, maintaining law and order situation is more important. Now, uh, one imp important thing about Bangladesh and the recent development of the laws of Bangladesh I must share is that uh, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh uh, issued a rule in 2015 uh, that death penalty should not be considered as a mandatory punishment. It is a punishment. There are some laws which have permitted providing or awarding death penalty, but it should not be uh, considered as a mandatory punishment. Uh, let me give an example because in 2010, there was a case in relation to uh, rape. A minor was uh, convicted of raping another minor girl. So uh, the minor person who was named as Shukur Ali, he was being given death penalty, first of all. But after that, uh, there was there is an NGO, BLAST, which is a very popular NGO in Bangladesh. It filed a rich petition before the High Court Division that death penalty should not be given a minor person because there should be other things which must be considered as Navdeep said. Uh, these are the things which are being you know, considered by the courts of Bangladesh as well. Uh, so therefore, after the writ petition was filed, the High Court Division especially ruled that death penalty should not be considered as a mandatory punishment. It can be given for uh, the crimes which are considered as the rarest of the rare crimes, but uh, it, a law cannot just state that uh, if a person is being found to have committed this crime, irrespective of other circumstances, the person should be provided with death penalty. It should not be the case because it is somehow unconstitutional. Uh, 
uh, I'd like to refer to an article of the Constitution of Bangladesh, which is Article 35. Uh, this article says that no person shall be subjected to cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment. So there is a debate over providing death penalty in Bangladesh that providing death penalty is a kind of cruel, inhuman, in, uh, inhuman and degrading punishment. So this should be uh, abolished. So just to respond to this debate, uh, it has been practiced in Bangladesh for you know last uh, 20 years, I would say. There is no specific statistics, but from my understanding, for last 20 years, there has been a uh, very less number of uh, accused who have been provided with death penalty. Uh, like if I uh, specify more, after the liberation war of Bangladesh, we got liberated in 1971. As far as the statistics is in concern, there is uh, there are 280 plus convicted criminals who are provided with death penalty. Uh, so the number is comparatively less. Whereas there are some other uh, you know criminals. I mean more than 1,500 criminals who are now uh, uh, you know death convicts, but death sentence has not been uh, implemented in Bangladesh so far because the implementation of death penalty is comparatively less. Let me tell you the statistics of 2020. Till October uh, 7, 2020, there was only one person who was being uh, executed. Uh, and it was, uh, the person was being executed because he has killed uh, Sheikh Musbur Rahman, who is known as father of the nation for his contribution before and uh, during and after the liberation of Bangladesh. So he was one of the persons who was responsible for the brutal assassination of Sheikh Musbur Rahman. So that particular person was given death penalty and even executed in 2020. Even in 2019, again, there was only one person who was being uh, uh, executed for committing crime. And that was also a very special case because that person was responsible for uh, assassinating uh, a Saudi diplomat whose name is um, Khalaf Al-Ali. Uh, so uh, Mr. Uh, Saif Al-Islam who was being executed, he was, a uh, he was uh, working in the consular section of the Saudi Arabian embassy, and he was a person who was being convicted for killing a Saudi diplomat, Khalaf Al Ali. So he was the only person who was being convicted in 2019. And even in uh, other years, even in most interestingly, 2018, there was no execution of death sentence. The number is zero. However, in uh, 2017, in 2016, and 2015, the numbers are quite high. I mean, in 2017, uh, there were 10 people who were being executed. In 2016, uh, six people were executed. And these are the people who were responsible for committing uh, genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes during the liberation war uh, of Bangladesh in 1971. So Bangladesh, uh, from my opinion, Bangladesh has also uh, you know, progressed a little bit by reducing the number of execution, even though a lot of people are being imposed death sentences after uh, convicting themselves, but then they are being provided pardon after a certain period of time. So this is how Bangladesh is uh, executing death sentences in Bangladesh. But in terms of effectiveness, there is no specific uh, statistics, I would say, but number of crime is increasing in Bangladesh. Uh, if I just tell you about the present scenario, pres uh, right now the young generation are demanding for hanging the rapist, just simply for rapist. So they are demanding that the rapist should be hanged, they should be killed uh, in an extrajudicial manner. Why is this demand? Because the number of rapists, uh, you know, like increasing day by day in Bangladesh. So there is a kind of public demand in Bangladesh for death penalty. But uh, as far as the criminal justice system of Bangladesh is in concern, the number of execution of death penalty is reducing. And we also consider that death penalty uh, should be uh, practiced in a restricted manner. It should not be provided to the persons who are being always found, uh, you know, convicted for different crimes. Even uh, like corresponding to Mr. Malik, I would say I believe uh, the reformative theory. I believe in the reformative theory because the criminals should be reformed. They should be given a second chance to uh, be a reformed person. 
So these are the things which have been, you know, quite in a mixed situation in Bangladesh. There are debates over uh, abolishing death sentence. At the same time, there are many people who are demanding that death sentence should not be uh, abolished. Even for the rapist, it should be uh, made unquestionable that they should be provided with death sentence because the number of rape is, uh, rape is increasing day by day. So we are in a mixed situation right now, uh, but I would like to uh, note one thing lastly that from my part, I believe that increasing number of conviction is more important instead of providing death sentences. Rather, uh, the criminals should be given chance to reform themselves. But it depends on some, uh, you know, socio-economic issues as well as uh, Oni uh, said that there are some restrictions of uh, the economic sectors or the resources of a country. So. If you want to implement the reformative theory, uh, you know, to the fullest, then you have to have enough number of resources as well. So these are the things which are being faced faced by the people of Bangladesh, and we are still improving. Uh, the legal system is still advancing, along with some debates right now in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an elaborate answer. Thank you very much. Okay, now to move on to the next question, I would um, pass on the mic to Ashna. Please, are here to take the next question? Professor Navdi. Yes, hello. Uh, Mr. Navdi, there are some questions for you in the chat box. I would like to address yes. those questions to you. Elena is asking whether the four protections in the Constitution of India against the death penalty are created because India is trying to gradually move towards finally abolishing death penalty. Well, four protections are not being guaranteed under the Constitution of India because India is shifting to uh, abolishing of death penalty, number one. Secondly, eventually, the in 2017, these four protections have been guaranteed since very long. Like these have evolved before the before 2000. So these four protections are exist in the uh, exist in the constitutional in the constitution of India from a very long time ago. And this is not because the India is shifting to uh, shifting to abolishing of death penalty. But again, uh, as the uh, Law Commission of India, it has recommended the uh, swift abolition of death penalty, uh, and uh, death penalty should be awarded only in two uh, two, two two types of uh, crimes committed by people, uh, and those two categories are uh, uh, terrorism number one and number two waging war against the state. So this is a recommendation yet. It has not been uh, formally, you know, enacted into a law. But yes, this is a recommendation, and India is gradually shifting to uh, abolishing of death penalty. Thank you so much sir, for the answer. There's another request for you, asking for the case name that you repeated in the end. If you could later put it in the chat, I'll proceed with the next question. Uh, Ayush yeah, asks whether Ayush is asking that. Since you mentioned that deterrence is one of the aims of punishing a criminal, don't you think that protection from death penalty eradicates the entire motive behind it? It is widely seen that judges refrain from giving out death penalties to the convicts. So instead of fulfilling, fulfilling the entire motive of criminal law, that is to set up standards of a safe society, it is encouraging the people at a certain degree. For example, if they murder someone in a certain less brutal way, they would be given a lesser punishment than those who commit the same crime in a much brutal way. This question is open for all the panelists who would like to comment on the same. So uh, I will attempt to answer it first since I am in the group. So thank you. Uh, firstly, this theory of deterrence will get defeated. I don't agree to it because see, let me, t let me put it to you like this. If you have committed a crime of murder, there is a punishment for it, which may be extended to 10 years or life imprisonment or death sentence. So that depends on the discretion of the judge who is awarding the sentence, number one. Secondly, it has to be seen the brutality of the crime, as I already said, that death penalty is something which attracts the attention of the Human Rights Commission, as well as other things also which affect the society in total. So therefore, 
these these protections which are guaranteed under the constitution of india that is to you know restrict the awarding of these sentences and though death penalty is being practiced in india but the thing is that whosoever is the accused whether it may be a, a terrorist of any country or it may be a indian citizen when he is being you know prosecuted or trialed in the courts of the india at that point of time they grow they go through such a uh, grievous process of trial that it is uh, it 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 that let's say if somebody is convicted from the trial court in 3 years or 4 years or in 5 years then he he has the option to appeal the matter before the high court even if he doesn't get relief in the high court he can file an appeal before the supreme court if even his appeal gets dismissed he can file a review petition before the supreme court once the review petition is dismissed he can again file a curative petition for the supreme court to review the judgment even not succeeding there he can file a mercy petition before the president of india in that he will ask for a recommendation from the home minister of india so this this is a tedious procedure and this is a very very filtered process that somebody is being awarded death penalty that means that he will have to go through this rigorous process of trial of at each and every forum he will be you know filtered with something so if if at all there is a likelihood that consider considering a uh, likelihood of considering his uh, crime or his act is of nature that he it may be compensated to life imprisonment or for that matter of any other punishment which is not death penalty at all he will be awarded with that as i all uh, earlier also said the 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 motive of the courts or the aim of the indian courts is to is not to award death penalty but death penalty should be awarded to those who has committed crimes which are not except not at all acceptable to the society or which are very in very heinous in nature very grave in nature so that is would any other panelists like to add to the same question okay so we'll move to the next question which is actually there's a lot of discussion going about this Mr Malik this question is for you um so the participants are asking whether the brexit is going to affect anything with later the death penalty so they are saying since the human right act implements the echr into the uk's domestic laws do you think now after brexit uk will bring back the death penalty because now it is not obligated by the echr well uh, very interesting question um politicians question um i don't know what will happen that, that, that's the truth there's so many debates going on you see it in articles you see it on uh, television programs etc you read it in the newspapers um i sincerely hope not i hope that the human rights act will stay but clearly once we exit brexit it's going to be at the will of parliament politicians mps etc and also uh, no doubt the public of which way uh, they want to go um, but i would have thought that 1965 was the line which was firmly drawn in the sand by parliament because as i said the death penalty debate never went to the public had it gone to the public at that time in 1965 i think the public Uh, and there was an outcry afterwards when the uh, abolition when the death penalty was abolished that 75% of the people wanted the death penalty to remain but it didn't go to the public it was decided by a private members bill that was introduced in parliament and as i said before from 1965 up until 1997 uh, sorry sub sub subsequent uh, governments did debate in the house of commons whether the death penalty should stay or not and it was always defeated so i, I would I think I'm fairly confident in saying personally that the death penalty will not be reintroduced in England. It may change. I know people want the death penalty to come in, but I think England because in principle Britain is against the death penalty. I am against the death penalty as a lawyer. I always have been and I always will be. I respect the right to life and obviously under article 6 of the Human Rights Convention you know i believe in the right to a fair trial how far if the uk post brexit will depart from that 
I know not. But knowing the UK and how the legal system works there, I think um, Britain will keep and respect the spirit of that. That's my opinion. It may change. I can't say it. It's a $6 million question. I hope that assists whoever was asking the question. Yes, thank you so much, sir. But we are, we are signed up to the, so far as the Human Rights Act is concerned, the law at the moment as it stands, the courts have to adhere to, or, or any laws that are passed in England and must be as far as they can be compatible with the Human Rights Act. Where they are not compatible, obviously there is the leeway there that an individual can then take a case or challenge the government by taking it to the European, uh, European Human Rights Court. Thank you Hello. so much sir, for the answer. Pleasure. Pleasure. There's another question. So okay. Yes, Shabaya, go ahead. Okay, just as an addition to the question that was asked to Sam Malik, um, I would like to ask again, um, if death penalty was to return to the UK, what sort of crimes do you feel would result in execution? Well, murder, obviously of a child murder of even an adult, uh, clearly, if it's in cold-blooded or premeditated murder. Uh, I think certainly in relation to terrorism acts, because London has seen now its fair share of terrorists, it has the world has, where innocent victims at large have obviously died and lost their lives and so forth. Uh, certainly sexual offences of children uh, who suffer at the hands of um, the accused. Um, those are the immediate ones that come to my mind. Uh, certainly, uh, paedophilia related offences, because paedophilia is, is an ongoing menace for the whole world, and there are notorious gangs out there, worldwide networks, that obviously are dealing in child abuse and so forth. So those, I think terrorism is a very hot issue in, in England, uh, certainly. Uh, and people have asked and said, well, look, you know, is it right that we should have? But you've got to also bear in mind, and this was noted by my friend, uh, learned friend in, 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 in Bangladesh. Um, you've got to look at, it's interesting that when it was debated in parliament to abolish the death penalty, it was more on morality and human, uh, on humanity. Never was it mentioned miscarriages of justice. It wasn't brought up. And yet we have had miscarriages of justice in England. Um, the one that always, and I'm sure all law students are taught on the LLB law degree that still brings my, my, my hairs on my arms stand up is the one of Derek Bentley, the 19 year old, 20 year old young lad. Uh, four words that sent him to the gallows, let him have it. He was a young man, even though he was 19 at the time, but had a mental age of 12. And this was shown to the court at the time, the judge, his sister, again and time and time again said, look, he's mentally not all there. He's, you know, he's got mental health problems, etc. It was later on proved that the police officers in the case had lied. Later, it was proved that when those words were shouted from where he was stood and where the shot took place, it was his accomplice who fired the fatal shot and the police officer died. That those words could not have been echoed to him and we there was always doubt did he mean let him have it as in let the officer have the gun or did he mean let him have it as in shoot him but he was made the scapegoat and he was he was sentenced to death because they couldn't sentence the core accomplice because he was 16 at the time uh, obviously later on he was posthumously um, pardoned but what good is that you can't bring the dead back, 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 back to life again the, the other one is the famous Birmingham Six, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Those men, let's imagine, what if they had been executed? And this had come out, transpired later, that glycerine, you know, could be on the hands because they were playing with cards, etc. Their confessions were beaten out of them. There were mock executions in their cells where police officers came and put hoods over their heads and put guns to their heads. Uh, they, they had barking dogs at them, etc. and so forth. This all came out later on. And they were eventually released at least, thank God. They were compensated in money, but had they been put to the death penalty, 
we couldn't have brought them back to life from from uh, from from the from the grave. So in that respect, you know, it is better to sentence them to life. And if then evidence comes up that they were sentenced, they were innocent, at least they can be released and compensated. Obviously, we can't give them back the lost years of their lives, etc., and so forth, but at least they still have their life. Thank, thank you very sorry, much for that answer. That. Yeah. Pleasure. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. For want of time, please, um, we'll be rounding up shortly because um, we are. I'm sorry, there were a lot of questions there that I've not had a chance to reply <laughs> back to. I apologize that uh, they can contact me on LinkedIn or leave me, and I, you know, I, I will answer them. Uh, I'm sorry, there was some about the human rights. I think I've answered one or two, but there were others that I didn't get a chance to answer. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Um, shortly, thank you everyone for such a vibrant session. I would also like to thank all the participants for joining us as well. You can also find a recorded version of this session on our YouTube channel as well. And we we'll do well to also, as much as possible, forward your, your other questions to our speakers as well. Because there was a question for Mrs. Oye, and also I think there was a question for Sam Mohammed. I will do well to forward those questions as well to them at the end of the session. And we'll be ending the session very soon. But more like a vote of thanks, I'll call on Shivani now to um, say the vote of thanks. Thank you, so Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. us. And it was really amazing. It was insightful to know about all the different laws and how it's all functioning. There were a lot of new things that I've learned through the session. Thank you so much once again for joining us. And thank you, Shabayo, and all our speakers who've been amazing and have given us really insightful sessions. Thank you again. And to all the thank ones who have so participated, you guys, thank you. Thank you for having us there. Thank you to the thank audience. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.